Okay, last time we saw the sequent calculus for first order logic, and I think I mentioned this already gives us a basis for implementing first order logic. A, a guy at IBM named Hao Wang uh, built a theorem prover for first order logic, which was able to prove, if I'm not mistaken, something like 400 theorems, all the theorems mentioned in Principia Mathematica that were pure logic, and it did it in some tiny amount of time, like under a second, for all 400. Um, I should mention the computer was an IBM 704, which, like all computers of the 1950s, was coal-fired, so while it was running your program, you needed a guy called the fireman who would be shoveling coal into the firebox, and of course, if the coal ran down, the computer would run slower and slower, and so it was a very, a, really a tremendous achievement that he could prove all those theorems so quickly. So you might think, okay, problem solved for first-order logic. Well, no. Um, so the fact is, although it was great on all those problems, um, is it a thing about logic that things can get harder so easily? So what I'm about to embark on <clears throat> is describing more sophisticated methods for theorem proving. They were way better than the methods implemented by Wang, and yet still, Every time they tried a hard problem, they ran into a brick wall. So in fact, even today, so what, goodness, how many years has it been like? Is it 60 nearly since? Because this stuff was being done in the early 60s. So yeah, 60 years of research. Um, and the provers we have today are unbelievably more powerful. And of course, computers got a bit faster as well. They got rid of the coal. They're all electric now. Computers are electric instead of coal. Um, and that was a big improvement. However, um, still, if you make a big enough problem, or not even a big problem, just a slightly tricky problem in first order logic, um, you're not going to get a proof. Never, I don't want to discourage you, though. Um, these tools that we have today can be used for a lot of cool things. Um, the main ingredient for all these technologies is so-called clause form. And this gives us prologue as well. In fact, when I started lecturing this course way before any of you were born, this course was called Foundations of Logic Programming, because way back in 1990 or whatever, prologue was thought to be the hottest thing ever. It's not anymore. It still, it survives. It has not transformed the world, and you can go through life without learning prologue, without coming to any harm, whatever. Nevertheless, um, there was a big overlap between all this stuff here and prologue. So we are concerned here with these clauses. Now, I've mentioned already the logical languages we tend to use that we've seen so far have a lot of redundancy in the hope of being a little more readable than they otherwise would be. I mean, let's not pretend any logical formula is readable, but you can be more or less readable. So clause form is where we get rid of almost everything and reduce ourselves to a language where these K's and L's have got to be atomic symbols. So they are, there's nothing in there. So this is something like P, that's all. No structure in there at all. So we are compiling down our lovely big logical formula with all the if and only ifs and all the quantifiers into these, basically, these strings. These are atomic formulas ORed together, and the only thing you can do is you can stick a knot on some of them. So that's a clause. And we're going to have lots of clauses, and they will be implicitly added together. So this whole thing will be basically representing a gigantic formula in conjunctive normal form. And given that you can have, in some situations, millions of clauses, we can deal with some quite big formulas. Um, this thing, that's clearly those are all negated, those are all positive. We will call these negative literals, and those are positive literals. We can write them in different notations. So I typically write them as sets. 
It's a bit old-fashioned, actually. And one of the problems with set notation is that you can never tell, is he talking about a clause or is that just some random set that he bumped into? So there's absolutely nothing wrong with putting in the, the disjunction symbols. Then it's a bit clearer what you're working with. And in fact, this seems to be the modern trend in modern papers. People write them as disjunctions. Um, Kowalski notation. There was a guy at Imperial College, I think, who was a big kind of a guru for um, logic programming, Robert Kowalski, also known as the A.I. Atola back then. Um, so these two notations are the same, right? If you put the arrow in either direction, I see they are slightly different looking arrows, but I wouldn't let that worry you. Um, all these things mean exactly the same clause. So they are all different ways of writing that clause. You can see you can have this. The thing that it's got the arrow pointing at are the positive literals, and the other side are the negative literals. Um, we are very, very interested in the empty clause, which you see you can write like simply an empty set. But if you're not using set notation, you can write it like this hollow box. Um, the empty clause is false. Why is that? Well, just think, when is a disjunction true? Exactly when at least one of the literals in it is true. No literals means it can never be true. We're very interested in the empty clause because we will only be proving things by contradiction. This, again, is why none of this stuff works for intuitionistic logic, you know, which I keep talking about in random asides, because proof by contradiction doesn't, is not a general principle there, so they are stuck. They have to do other things. So we are going to look at two main clause form methods in this course, and what I've got on this slide is what's common between them. Now, you've all come across proof by contradiction before, I hope, right? It's the idea that you want to prove a thing so you get a contradiction from the negation of it. Like you want to prove that the, oh wait. Some of these are just proving a negation. I, 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 I will not get distracted here. You all have come across proof by contradiction, right? So I don't need to explain this. Um, we are going to use contradiction everywhere as a way of proving things. In other words, we are always going to start with a negated formula, do stuff to it. If we are lucky, get a contradiction, and then say we proved A. And there is no more heartbreaking mistake you can make on an exam than to omit the first step of sticking a negation sign in front of the thing that you're going to work on for the next 15 minutes. But that's how it goes. Um, so negate your formula, translate the negation into conjunctive normal form. Remember, I showed you how to do that in the second lecture. Now you drop the and symbols, and those separate um, formulas are your clauses. Because remember, CNF, conjunctive normal form, every one of those is a disjunction of literals, and that's exactly what a clause is. Um, now, what do I mean by transform? Well, here, the thing is that we have two different clause methods. One is called SAT solving, um, also known as uh, DPLL after the inventors. And that one works on propositional logic. It can handle really big problems like millions of clauses, I think hundreds of thousands of vari variables. When I say variables for propositional logic, I mean propositional variables. Um, and these transformations, in general, are preserving only the satisfiability of the set of clauses. In other words, they are preserving the, proper, the property of whether um, there exists a model or not. So often these transformations will actually change the meaning of the clauses, and it's quite a powerful thing that we don't really care about that. We can do stuff. We can throw clauses away. We can invent new clauses. We can do all kinds of things as long as we preserve the, the central question, which is whether there's a contradiction lurking in there or not. 
Then, finally, if we manage to find the empty clause, we say, aha, contradiction, um, therefore not A has been refuted, which means A is a theorem. What can also happen, now this happens much more with the first thing, which is SAT solving. Oh, I never even mentioned the name of the other thing. The other thing is called resolution. Um, in SAT solving, it is very easy to get the empty clause set. That means that I have, because you can throw away clauses if you don't like them, if there is some reason why you can tell they're redundant or you just don't like their face, you can, well, if you don't like their face, and clauses don't have a face. Anyway, you can delete clauses under certain circumstances, and it may well happen that you end up where there are no clauses left at all. At that point, well, first, you can't do anything if there are no clauses. Secondly, the empty set of clauses is trivially satisfiable because all you have to do is satisfy all the clauses. If there aren't any, then every model satisfies all the clauses. So the empty clause set means there are models in which case the negation is satisfiable, and that means that the original A is not a theorem after all, and you even have a counterexample to it. Um, just to add to the confusion, occasionally with SAT solving, we are simply... We're not even interested in proving a thing, so we don't start with a thing and negate it. We just take a whole bunch of clauses and ask, is there a model for these clauses? And sometimes just getting the model is an interesting thing in itself. So where did this all come from? <clears throat> well, somebody did a PhD. I don't recommend it. PhDs are hard work, and they drive people crazy. But this guy, this guy named Herbrand, he's French, so I can mispronounce his name horribly. Everyone calls him Herbrand. Um, Mr. Herbrand proved his theorem in his thesis, which gave a way of reducing first-order logic to propositional logic in a certain sense. Um, I will kind of give us a very, very, very quick overview of this, but only a, a very quick one because um, it's, a bit, it's a bit technical. Now, somehow that then was recognized that his theorem gave the possibility of fully automatic theorem proving and therefore fully automated mathematics. Actually, this idea kept coming up again and again. Um, so how Wong, the guy I mentioned earlier, he wrote in his paper about his first-order prover how what he really would like to do was formalize big chunks of various classic mathematical textbooks. He referred to them. I really want to formalize these, but first we need to do logic. So lots of people were inspired by the idea of making a machine that could just do mathematics. Um, now, we can't in general for many reasons... And actually, I think it would be kind of sad if all mathematical questions could be ground up by a machine. It's an interesting thing that chess is still fun, even though computers are much better than us at chess. Um, but typically, if you ever, if any of you play chess against a computer, of course, you don't use it in its sort of maximum mode because you'll always lose, and that's very discouraging. Um, as for mathematics, sorry, I'm going on a slight tangent, but I think there's time... Um, you all probably learned about Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry turns out to be decidable, which means, in a certain sense, in a mathematical sense, there are no interesting questions in Euclidean ge geometry in the sense that any question you ask, it can be fed to a computer program and a yes or no can come out, which means there's no mystery anymore. There's no reason why people should toil away and try and prove such things. Um, on the other hand... Uh, turns out this decision procedure for even for Euclidean geometry, uh, the running time of this is not exponential. It is rather a tower of exponentials. So there is still a bit of mystery even there. Okay, let me continue. Uh, there were loads and loads of logicians who were interested in 
doing this automatic mathematics. And one of the, f I find, fascinating is that if you look at the names attached to some of these early computer programs, they're effing philosophers who wrote like philosophical essays and philosophical anthologies. And these are not the normally the sort of people you associate with sitting down and writing kind of complicated code in assembly language, but it was about proving theorems. So you see, you know, some philosophers got their hands dirty. Um, in fact, I think our one of our former heads of department, Roger Needham, he was trained as a philosopher as well. Anyway, so I said this already. The sequent calculus, which we just saw in the last lecture, handles quantifiers, but it doesn't scale. In a sense, actually, none of these things scale, but it doesn't scale at a very low level. Um, but this was looked at, but it was soon seen that it was not suitable. In 1960, I think Gilmore tried showing unsatisfiability. In other words, they already were fixed on this proof by contradiction. That came from Hebron's approach. Uh, based on conversion to disjunctive normal form. If you want to know why disjunctive normal form, you may remember in our second lecture, I showed that if you took a formula, converted to conjunctive normal form, if it was a tautology, the conjunctive normal form would definitely come out as simply true. This works dually for disjunctive normal form. So if you take a formula, convert it to DNF, if that formula was unsatisfiable, the DNF will definitely be simply false. So that's the way of detecting unsatisfiability, but it's exponential, slow, useless, etc. So then these guys, again, Martin Davis, Hillary Putnam, they're both philosophers. Um, wrote their decision procedure for propositional logic, and then two guys whose names began with L uh, jazzed that up a bit to give us the DPLL approach which we're going to spend the rest of the lecture on. This, there's even a, sorry, to tell the story, this didn't turn out so great for what they wanted to do, Robinson then came along with resolution, um, which we're also going to get a bit later, which turned out to be much more powerful for the whole Erbrand thingy. Um, and see an interesting quirk of the story, actually quite interesting if any of you are thinking of doing research later in your life. So the DPLL was relegated to a has-been technology, but it turned out only temporarily. So now it is a huge thing now, and it's just an interesting how a thing can go away and then come back. Um, since we're proving things by contradiction, uh, it's worth looking for a moment at the idea that a contradiction implies everything. So there's a story that a student challenged Bertrand Russell over the idea that from a contradiction uh, everything is true. And so he said, okay, uh, Professor Russell, let's suppose one equals zero, prove that you are the Pope. To which he replied, if one equals zero, then two equals one. And so the two element set consisting of myself and the Pope is also a one element set. Therefore, I am the Pope. And that is not a joke. That is absolutely valid reasoning. Um, and if you don't want to bring in sets, it's actually quite easy to see, like as I show on the slide, if you've got one equals zero, then using basic arithmetic, you can easily show that every number equals every other number, and so on and so forth. And in fact, in the lambda calculus, which you haven't had yet, but will have by the end of the term, if you have the equivalent of one equals zero in the lambda calculus, then you can show that everything equals every other thing. So indeed, um, contradictions are a bad thing in general, and in particular, in most formal calculi, they do indeed, for very good reason, they are assumed to imply everything there is.
Okay. So what is DPLL? Actually, I should mention, so if you look at modern papers on DPLL today, they often assume it incorporates all the super clever heuristics that were invented in the late 1990s. And that is a bit misleading because these four guys had nothing to do with those, those advances. But they, they invented the core idea. So again, this is a clause method that fits the framework I showed you on, like the second slide. You know, you take the formula, negate it, convert to clauses. Once you've got your clauses, here is where um, our one option is to do DPLL. So we've got our clauses, and the first step, if you've got any tautological clauses, get rid of them. A tautological clause is one like it has P, but also it has not P. So it's saying P or not P, big deal, delete. Um, then you look at your unit clauses, that is your one element clauses, now remember, we're trying to get the empty clause, um, and clearly the shorter the clause, if you like, the closer it is to the empty clause. So short clauses are your friend, and in particular, if you have a unit clause, you can use it to simplify all the other clauses in the following way. So if I have a unit clause, say L, remember our set of clauses is a big conjunction. And it is a, a conjunction of these individual clauses, each of which is a disjunction. So if I have a clause that says simply L, that is the assertion L is true. If L is true and I have some other clause with an L in it, that clause is saying L or other stuff. But that's useless, right? We know L is true, so L or other stuff is of no interest to us. Delete. You might have some other clauses that say not L, but we already know L is true, so not L is false, and since it's being ORed with other stuff, we, we don't need it, so delete just the literal not L from those clauses. Now, if you think a moment how you would actually implement this, because we need to do a search, we need to do a lot of backtracking, as it turns out, you won't, when I say delete the clause, it will probably be marked in some certain way so that it will be kind of ignored. When I say delete a literal, likewise, it will, you'll probably just uh, set some flag to say this, this literal no longer exists. Then you can easily reverse it, as you will need to do as you backtrack. Ah, the other thing, pure literals, I needed a diagram here, I didn't have one. What is a pure literal? It is one that only appears one way. So let's say there's a literal, let's say it's M, and I have lots and lots of M's in my clauses, but they're all positive. They always have the same sign. That is, they're all positive. So if I just say, oh, M is true, nothing can go wrong because there is not a single occurrence of not M anywhere. So if you have such a pure literal, you may as well just assume M is true, and to assume M is true is the same as deleting that particular clause because, you know, if I have M or other stuff and I've assumed M is true, then the clause, the whole clause is true, so we can delete it. Exactly the same idea if all the M's are negated, then you can say, okay, M is false, and then you can delete all the clauses containing uh, that literal. Um, with, if you do that, you might find you have more pure literals because you've deleted a whole bunch of clauses. That may cause other literals to become pure. So you might, if you're lucky, get a big cascade of deletions, especially if it sometimes happens that you have a lot of redundant clauses around, like you have a lot of background theories that you brought in that are not referring to anything that you actually have in your problem, in which case you might get a lot of pure literals. Okay, so these are all the easy steps. But finally, there is the backtracking possibility. So if I don't have any tautologies, or if I've dealt with them, I don't have any more unit clauses, I don't have any pure literals. 
then we need, if you like, to force the situation by picking some other literal and doing a case split on it. A case split means we're going to temporarily assume that L, say, temporarily assume it's true, see what happens. Um, in particular, if you assume L is true, and then you say, I get a model in the end, then you have a model for the whole set of clauses in which L is true plus whatever else you discovered. If, on the other hand, you say L is true, work for a bit, contradiction, what does that tell us? It tells us L must be false. So then you go to the other case and you, you look at what happens when the case at L is false. Um, so this decides propositional logic. Now, you probably all know, even though you don't get complexity till next term, I think, but I hope everybody knows kind of what NP-complete means. The NP-complete problem is a hard problem that's probably exponential, and the satisfiability problem for clauses is the exact problem that was the first ever NP-complete problem to be invented, to be discovered. So this, we are not going to expect a polynomial time algorithm to check for satisfiability of clauses. Nevertheless, with certain refinements, this thing can be remarkably fast and handle, as I said, millions of clauses in hundreds of thousands of variables, solving all kinds of cool problems. Okay, now let's use DPLL to try to prove this formula here. We've seen this formula twice before. It's not a, a tautology, and therefore we can expect DPLL to fail, but let's just see what happens. First, we convert to clause form. Uh, I'm skipping the steps here. Um, and just looking at this, so before I go through the rigmarole, what do we see here? Two unit clauses, they're negative. Uh, we have a pure literal, right? Can you see that P is a pure literal? Because it's positive, but it's never negative. Uh, in fact, R is also a pure literal. Um, this is kind of hopeless. So like, I can already see R is going to be false. Um, P is going to be true. And once I get rid of those two, then Q is going to be false. In fact, I can do the whole thing here using pure literal elimination alone, which is kind of pathetic. <laughs> uh, and what did I say? I said... P is true, R is false, and then Q is false. Now we can check here. Q and R false makes the right side false, P true, and then indeed this falsifies the formula. Okay, that was me blathering. Let's see a kind of formal version of it. So we write out our clauses. Now here um, I said let's do it as a unit clause. In fact, it doesn't matter because, um, what did I say? Which do we do first? I, according to, and I don't know why, it kind of looks a bit wrong. Why do I say unit first and then pure? Well, it was in some book, I guess, that I copied it out of. It seems to be more natural you would look at for the unit, for the pure literals first. But in any case, uh, certainly a unit clause is a very quick thing to pick up. So we say, ah, not Q is a unit clause. So we delete Q from this. We have PR, and these are both pure literals, and the rest is, as I said, already. Now, that example was maybe too small to be interesting. So this one is slightly bigger. So this one will turn out, this will turn out to give us a contradiction. Um, so first of all, notice there are no tautologies, no unit clauses, obviously, and with a little more, a bit of, it's a bit tedious, but you can quickly see that there are no pure literals either. So for example, I have Q there not Q there, so it's not pure, and so on. So what do we do? We have to pick a variable and do a case split on it. 
and if you, a, a, a real SAT solver, would devote some energy to choosing the right variable in order to, you know, to, to minimize the search space, uh, one of the things we would certainly try is to choose one from the shortest possible clause because that will give us more unit clauses to play with. So we do P because P is nice. And we say, well, either P is true or P is false. Now, first of all, looking at it informally, um, if P is true, this clause goes away, right? Sorry. This clause goes away because P is true. Funny, that is the only clause, uh, and that clause, this is very awkward with my hands. So two things go away, and all the others will be kept, but we'll have to delete the not P's. Remember, if P is true, not P is false, and therefore it just can be deleted from that disjunction. Yeah, if I were doing these slides again, I think I would use disjunctions for them all, but whatever. So there, that's what's left if P is true. Then I just copied them down. Um, what do we think will happen here? I can see a unit clause, um, and I can tell you what that's going to do. It's going to delete these Qs, that Q and that Q, and this unit clause here. Remember, this says Q is false is going to completely delete this clause over there because that says not Q or something else. Um, so that's what a unit, the unit rule then for not Q will leave us with that, which is clearly a contradiction. Again, either unit clause can be picked and it will have the same effect. So I chose R, but I could equally have chosen not R. We now have derived the empty clause, which means we have refuted the assumption that P is true, right? This does not end the game. If I found a model, it would end the game. In other words, if I had found a model of this with P being true, then I found a model of the set of clauses, and then you stop. Um, if P is false, what happened here? So P false means we have to delete those clauses that mention not P, and we have to delete P from this other clause, and that's why we end up with that. Um, now we have two unit clauses. We can kind of pick at random which one we're going to look at first. So I did the, the not R. The effect is to delete this. And in fact, um, notice when you do a unit clause, you delete the clause itself in addition to all the others. So not R goes away here when I do the unit clause because it's not needed anymore. So we found a contradiction in both cases. That means P cannot be true, but also P cannot be false. Therefore, the entire set is contradicted. But if I had found a model in either case, then I would have a model of the set of clauses. So these clauses are unsatisfiable. So the funny thing is, so in the, in the late 1990s, some people started looking at this technology again. I think the idea is resolution grabbed the attention of the theorem-proving world for I don't know, 20 years from like 1965 until, well, I don't know, disillusionment can set in pretty quickly. By like 1980, people were starting to think resolution wasn't the way. Then they did other stuff. They did expert systems. Remember, people were trying to think using theorem proving, which is a really dumb idea. Um, but at some point, some people started playing with this again, and some point they invented some very clever new heuristics and they were starting to get some very powerful, uh, some from tremendous performance. But the other thing they did, they stopped trying to use theorem provers to think and they thought, what else can I do when I have the ability to handle 10 million clauses? So the idea that you can take all kinds of interesting problems, approximate them by a finite problem, think of a badly pixelated image, um, and somehow be able to get information out of it. And moreover, you can also detect, one of the things they do, I will not go into any detail, but 
You can detect a bug with your finite model, go back and check if that bug exists in the real thing. If the bug really exists, then you're finished. If the bug does not exist in the real thing, then they have a way of refining their finite model in exactly the place where it disagreed with the real thing. And so they can get successively better and better finite models. Uh, this, and what do they call this? Counterexample driven refinement. A very cool thing that um, was used in particular in this thing called SLAM, which Microsoft developed in order to stop their thing from blue screening every five minutes. Um, <clears throat> so it's cool. I could say one more word about this. So the reason device drivers tend to fail, firstly, all device drivers on Windows run in kernel mode, and there are like thousands of them from different vendors, some of whom really don't care whether your computer blue screens or not. And you could get a bug from a thing like you, you grab a resource, um, and if you forget to release the resource, then you will run out of that resource eventually. Or you grab the resource and you release it, and then you release the same resource again, which will maybe cause a blue screen. So <clears throat> I think Microsoft identified a thousand or so what you could call well-formedness conditions for device drivers, that is, behaviors that they had to conform to. And they discovered they could just look at the code, raw C code, feed it into this thing, and detect all these bugs. As I said, a bug like returning a resource more than once, or in some particular crazy combination of branching, forgetting to release the resource. But they could identify these bugs, and that is how they managed to get their reliability up. This last thing we will look at in a lecture or two, and I need to get a move on, but we still need our Dilbert. Well, I hope everyone found that inspirational. <laughs> so I'm going to have to hurry slightly because I wasted too much time blathering. Talk about resolution. So people got disillusioned with SAT solving fairly quickly. Remember, we're going back to 1963, right? So they got disillusioned with SAT solving. And Robinson, um, Alan Robinson, thought of a different way of doing things. Now, I'm showing you this in the propositional case simply for pedagogical reasons, but let me just stress, nobody ever does this for propositional logic. So we're going to see the full first order version in a couple of lectures. But the propositional version is based on a very simple bit of reasoning. If I know P or A, and if I know not B or C, then it turns out we have a or C. Why is that? Well, just think. B is either true or false. If B is true, then we know C. If B is false, then we know A. So that's why that's true. And the whole idea of resolution is to apply that to your clauses over and over again until you get the empty clause. Why is that better? Well, it's, in fact, it's not better in propositional logic. But it turns out this will do clever things for first-order logic. But as I said, we'll look at the propositional version first, just to keep things simple. If we rewrite these disjunctions to, in our set notation, now we are combining clauses. And now what we're doing with resolution is we've got two clauses. One has a literal B, which is positive. The other has the same literal B, only negative. And you can think of them as canceling out. And then the A or C becomes instead that you have to list all the literals in the conclusion of this. Um, you may worry, how can this be any good? Because how are we ever going to get the empty clause when this is getting longer and longer and longer? And in fact, the way is there's two ways 
One is that sometimes you will get two literals that are the same, in which case they will collapse down. And the other is you'd better have some unit clauses, because if you take a look, if one of these is a unit clause, like here, you'll see that the list is getting shorter. So resolution with a unit clause is a good thing to do. And of course, if I have B and not B, I have a contradiction and I'm finished. Because as with DPLL, we work by we negate the thing we want to prove, convert to clauses, do this stuff. If we get a contradiction, then we prove the theorem. Now, a little example here. Right, there's nothing easier to prove than this, right? I mean, that's clearly a fact. Um, okay, a little hint. If you ever would need to negate something that is the form of an Im implication, remember there's a hidden knot in the implication symbol. So if I want to negate this thing, I can leave the first part alone as A. All you have to do is negate the second part, which is B. So, so this thing, we will negate the first part and get not P. Wait a minute. That's exactly what you've done. <clears throat> Let me say that again. You, you keep the first part, that is to say A, sorry, P, Q separately. You negate the thing after the arrow, that will be not Q, not P. So that is the conversion of this thing into clause form. Spending your life, by the way, converting things into clause form, honestly, that is no, no way to live. Okay. Now this is, of course, trivial by resolution. We have two unit clauses, and so they will help us to um, cancel out the negated counterparts in that other clause to reach a contradiction. So you see P combined with that gives us not Q. Q not Q gives us the empty clause. So that's a baby example. So if you want to prove this certain distributed law, I've kind of cheated by putting in the negation already, but that's the thing we want to prove. Now what I've written here is you negate it, and the, we like to say we refute the negation. How do we refute the negation? Well, as I said before, you can take, when you're, negate, when you're doing this with an implication, take the left part unnegated and negate the right part there. So in this, luckily, and I try and do this because I hate people wasting time converting to um, clause form, there are two clauses sitting here on this left of the arrow already, that is P comma Q and P comma R because they are already in conjunctive normal form, that bit. So we immediately get those. On the other side, we have to negate this we're going to have a, a unit clause not P, I think. And yes, this, putting the not in there is not P. Putting your not there, you get not Q, not R. So, and I see I haven't written them all out again, so just look, these are our clauses here. There are four of them to play with. <clears throat> I should mention in general course, you'll have hundreds and hundreds of clauses, not on an exam, of which only maybe four or five will have anything to do with your proof, and all the rest are noise. And this is a test of a good theorem prover is one that can somehow um, find those four or five. Of course, it will end up doing lots and lots of useless resolutions and deriving all kinds of irrelevant clauses, but you may not know that at first. So you look at these four clauses, and what do you do? You say, aha, I've got a unit clause. And if you don't have a unit clause, incidentally, you're going to have to think of something clever, because without a unit clause, you're going to get into trouble. So it's very obvious without writing anything, but because I have this unit clause here, I'm going to be able to derive Q, 
I'm going to be able to derive R, and because I'll have Q, and because I'll have R, I'll be able to um, resolve and eliminate that and eliminate that and get a contradiction. And here's how it looks. You see I used this to get Q. I used it again. You can use a clause any number of times. There's no backtracking here, by the way. So DPLL and resolution are quite different. DPLL is a backtracking algorithm. Resolution is a saturation algorithm. Um, I have my Q. I have my R. Now I can derive not R. And from those two, I can get a contradiction. So what do we mean by saturation? Well, in general, it means we have a bunch of stuff in memory. We grind on it. More stuff goes into memory. Actually, since we don't want to run out of memory, we try also to throw away stuff that we can detect as redundant. Uh, we keep doing that until either the user gets tired or we run out of memory, or, of course, we get a contradiction. So I, this, this stuff is not so important, but let me go through it quickly. Honestly, do I want to even say this? Let me just have... I should have the picture. I wish I had my two projectors, actually. We start with... <sighs> picture. Take your initial clauses, dump them in a thing called the passive set. They will all sit there waiting to be processed. That's why it's called passive. Then at each cycle of the algorithm, you grab one of them. You use special heuristics to grab the most promising one. You grab one, it's the selected clause. Um, and you move it into this other thing called the active clause set. And you also do all possible resolutions between this selected clause and all of these so-called active clauses. The passive ones are just left alone. By the way, you, you don't have to do this on an exam. Right? You don't have to do any of this. This is just how you'd write a program to do this. So you, on an exam, will just draw lots of lines on paper and say, I got a contradiction. And that's fine. So this is, just, this is just for the computer. And by the way, the printer was running out of toner. This is not me trying to be artistic here. Um, you do all possible inferences. That you derive new clauses from the resolution. They get dumped back in the passive set. And you keep going round and round like this. Um, so picking out things from the passive set one at a time. If you run out, so if the passive set somehow runs out, then you failed to prove anything. But if you're lucky, at some point, the empty clause will be detected here, in which case you're done, right? That's that. Um, I'm not sure. Do I really want to talk about this? Very briefly, how do we pick the selected clause? Typically, they have the idea of a heavy clause versus a light one, and you want a light clause. A light clause is typically a short one, has very few literals. The literals have very simple expressions in them. Um, and typically, you can attach these so-called weights to things that you regard as things you don't want to have to reason about because they're somehow ugly. And then you can then, it gives you some heuristic control over which clauses will be selected and eliminated first. Um, there's tons of other things. The only thing that I do want to finish on time, I will mention, this is getting beyond the course. But just to say, I think you can tell that when you have a lot of clauses and you could connect any literal with any other literal, um, that there are many, many symmetries that I could do this one first and then that one, or I could do that one and then this one, and they are the same. Um, and so it is possible to impose orderings on the literals that so much restrict the search space that there is almost nothing that is legal to do at any time. Uh, and the point of that is, as I said, to eliminate all the redundant paths through the search space. And this, sometimes called the superposition method, 
has been the key to the very powerful things that we have today, which you can search for and download if you feel like it. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you.